That Esports Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to That Esports Podcast. I'm Golden Boy, and it is a pleasure to have you here today with me as we deep dive into all the latest and greatest in the wide world of esports. And man, there is a lot to talk about. A few things first uh, before we move on. Thank you so much for listening to last week's episode. Recorded it live from Belize. I know that there were some complaints about the audio being a little too low. I'll make sure I try and fix that moving forward. Still learning this whole editing podcast uh, game thing. So, you know, we'll get there eventually. Uh, also, uh, I do want to thank everyone for listening to that episode because it was our most successful episode of the podcast ever, even though I've only done two episodes. But it's nice to see some visual growth. Uh, so again, thank you so much for listening. Huge shout out to Flame once again from the Houston Outlaws for providing some great insight into what it is to be a general manager of an Overwatch League team. If you want to go ahead and listen to that one as well, you can check it out on that esports podcast episode two. Another note as well is that I will be away for the next two weeks, but don't worry, the podcast will still come at you. Uh, I'll be in Atlanta for uh, two weeks doing a project I can't talk about quite yet. But hopefully next week in the podcast, I'll be able to share it. Also, if you happen to enjoy the podcast, make sure you give us a follow on Spotify. Give me a like and a review or whatever they call that. Rate and review. There you go. Rate and review on Apple Podcasts uh, and then review wherever you choose to listen to your podcast. We're available everywhere. So give us a listen if you'd like. Now, I mentioned before how 2020 is going to be a crazy year for esports and that point still continues to be made even in this day. Uh, beginning of January, we have had some crazy, crazy deals that had just come out. Uh, most notably, and this is going to be the focus of today's you know, monologue, is the Call of Duty League's YouTube streaming deal. And this is a big deal because it's not just the Call of Duty League. It's the Overwatch League and Hearthstone Esports, which to me tells me that there is a bigger, broader plan for Hearthstone Esports, but we'll probably talk about that in a later episode. But what I would really like to focus on here is what YouTube entering the space in such a, an aggressive way means for Esports as a whole. Because you see, many, many moons ago, when YouTube gaming first came about, they were getting a little aggressive in the space. Uh, some may remember when the Halo 5 uh, World Championship was announced that it was famously attached to YouTube Gaming, Twitch, ESL, and MLG. And, you know, I heard rumblings that a lot of people weren't happy about how that was displayed, but YouTube Gaming was coming into the space. They wanted people to know that they were there and they're there to, to stake a claim in the world of competitive gaming in the world of esports. And since then, YouTube has had some shifts. It's not necessarily been all about live content like you initially would have thought when Twitch bought was or Twitch was bought by Amazon. You thought that you were going to get this war between live streaming companies YouTube and Twitch. Instead, Twitch continued on its merry way. Ninja got super huge, Fortnite blew up, but while all this was going on, streaming was still big on YouTube. It just wasn't the thing that YouTube needed to tell everyone was important because what's important is obviously VOD, video on demand content, because there's a difference between what Twitch does and what YouTube does. For Twitch, it's my time versus your time or my time over your time. But for YouTube, it's your time over my time because I'm putting out this content and you're going to watch it or listen to it or whatever, whenever you want. Versus Twitch, when I say I go live, that's the only time you're going to get me live. So it's a, it's a different kind of mentality of content and it's a different type of consumer. So because of that, Twitch has attracted an audience of individuals that tune in when the individual says that they are live. Whereas YouTube, when someone puts out a video, they'll just watch it whenever it comes out. Now with this play here, what YouTube is doing is they're basically telling their audience, like, listen, if you want to watch top tier esports, you can watch it on YouTube. But here's the thing. You can also check out all the VOD content as it comes out. So last week, we had the Call of Duty League officially launch in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Armory. It was a great time. 
And right before that, everyone kept wondering, where the hell are we going to watch this dang league? I had heard rumblings beforehand. Obviously, I'm not a leaker, so I didn't want to say anything. But I had heard rumblings beforehand about YouTube getting the rights to the Call of Duty League and the Overwatch League. And I had heard a lot of different rumblings in different directions. But it always intrigued me about why YouTube wanted to get involved in the space. Because look, the reality is that everyone's gonna come and watch the content on YouTube no matter what. It doesn't matter. YouTube is king when it comes to VOD content. It's as simple as that. No one will match them. They figured, hey, if people are coming to the platform to watch VOD, we might as well Keep them and watch live content as well. There was that recent move they made signing Courage. I believe they also signed Valkyrie from 100 Thieves. And that maybe seems more like, you know, my boy Fwiz, your boy Fizz, the Chaboy Fwiz, uh, doing a deal with his buddies to, you know, give them good content on the platform or give them a good base. But that really isn't it. What it is is that, you know, you have guys like Courage and Valkyrie that are blowing up content creators on Twitch that honestly could really flourish on a platform like YouTube. Typical Gamer, another one who is just massive and he does all live content, does incredibly well on YouTube. And when Nick 30 made the switch over from YouTube to Twitch, I was actually scratching my head about it because I felt like Nick 30 really entrenched himself in YouTube and people who want to watch content on YouTube are just going to stay on YouTube and watch content. That's just kind of like how it is uh, when it comes to live. But everyone goes to YouTube to watch VOD. So again, this this whole move was a little uh, uh, perplexing at first. And then you start to see, I guess, the, 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 the seeds being planted here for YouTube to tell all TOs in the space, hey, we're serious about esports on our platform. And, and, and here's the other thing too. Their esports has been on YouTube for a very long time now. You kind of look at the uh, League of Legends numbers and YouTube does incredibly well. Uh, I, I think that this is gonna be a huge, huge move. And it's also gonna put Twitch on notice. I'm, I'm okay with this. And the reason why I'm okay with Twitch being put on notice here is because Twitch for the longest time has been able to get away with essentially free content on their platform people going to Twitch first and foremost to produce events. Uh, it's been very, very commonplace. It's almost as if like people bake Twitch into their distribution plan, even though Twitch isn't paying for it. Uh, and this could potentially add a ripple in there where it's like, well, listen, hey, B-Site or ESL Pro League, YouTube is looking to spend some money and get involved in more high tier esports. Maybe you wanna watch over here. I don't ever see Riot ever transitioning away from Twitch, but I can see a world where maybe YouTube becomes the quote unquote preferred live broadcast provider for the League of Legends Championship Series. Maybe that's a thing down the line. YouTube entering this space in this manner, and they've always been here, but doing the play that they did for the COD League and for Overwatch as well as Hearthstone Esports has just been a, a big move that we all need to recognize because this could really change how 2020 plays out. This is the first big deal of 2020, but it's certainly not going to be the last. I think that YouTube and heck, I even think Mixer as well is going to try and get a little aggressive. Although I don't think Mixer can quite tackle esports events yet. I don't, I don't think that they can really challenge YouTube and Twitch in that realm because they simply just don't have the audience that want to watch that kind of content. Whereas people have come accustomed to watching esports on Twitch. And then people have also grown accustomed to watching VODs of esports events on YouTube. And that's something that Twitch has never been able to do. So to provide tournament organizers with a catch-all package, right? A, a, a turnkey solution for live streaming and VOD distribution, YouTube is pretty much as attractive as it could possibly get, while also sitting on Google's amazing SEO ecosystem. I think that it, this is just a mind-blowing play. And then let's not also forget the other big part of this too, was that now uh, uh, Google, uh, I think Google's cloud services will be the preferred uh, provider for the server infrastructure for uh, for Blizzard games. That was also, I, I think that actually was the bigger part of all of this, but obviously this is an esports podcast, not a, a game dev podcast. So because of that, 
you really can't focus on it too much, but it is a really, really big deal. And it also just shows that, hey, Amazon, maybe this big behemoth and uh, the stocks are insane for Amazon. The money's certainly there, but people are there to challenge. And it's going to be Alphabet, Google, YouTube. They're right on their heels when it comes to stuff like that, really putting a foothold. I think Stadia is going to see some benefits from this too. It's just an interesting time to be a gamer. And now it's also an interesting time to be an esports fan because you have all this competition centering around broadcast rights. And then you're also going to get all this competition for all the different games that are coming out with all the different leagues and, and formats. It's just, it's so awesome. Uh, but yeah, and, and speaking of different, you know, we, we talked to some Call of Duty and Overwatch people in the last two episodes, but this time we're talking about Apex Legends. I had the pleasure to talk to Snipe Down from what the team now is known as the Sniper Abusers, but I'm sure they're going to get picked up relatively soon. Uh, on Monday, they qualified for the Arlington Major and Snipe Down, in case you guys live under a rock and don't know who he is, is one of the most successful Halo players of all time. The man has many championships under his belt and since making the transition over to Apex has been a force to be reckoned with no matter what server he's in and getting second place just shy of TSM who are the back to back to back major champions getting second place in a qualifier to TSM was no slouch there and doing it in the way they did was very very impressive so we did get an opportunity to talk to snipe down but as always there's so much going on in this wide world of esports so let's jump right in to all the current events that are happening so you can't really dive into esports and the current events that happened this week without talking about the latest drama behind the ESL Pro League and B site. So in case you don't understand what that means, uh, ESL Pro League has been a long running uh, professional league for Counter-Strike for a very, very long time. They've had multiple seasons now. I've had the opportunity to host some of their major events or some of the final events for ESL Pro League. And it overall has just kind of been a staple of CS. But ever since the world of franchising came about, this has always been an attractive prospect for a lot of organizations. Being able to just have a seat at the table no matter what is so important. This is basically what made the Overwatch League such an attractive part of business for so many people that were involved in endemic esports was because they wanted to have a spot that was theirs. They weren't gonna get relegated. This was their part in the league. They had equal stake in the success of the league and that has always been attractive just like you would find in professional sports but counter-strike has always been weird they've always been different because valve isn't really involved in what goes on in counter-strike it's kind of odd it's almost like you have uh, a football like as if valve made football right just to bear with me on this analogy uh but the nfl was the tournament organizer uh valve is like hey cool you know we make the ball we make the rules we make everything but you guys just go ahead and do your thing. Uh, we won't really too, we, we won't be concerned. We won't be concerned about whatever it is you want to do. And I think that this is just a, a, a weird position for a lot of these TOs to be in because you don't have full control over it. Well, ESL and b site are trying to change that, trying to get some control over this whole business of Counter-Strike. And Counter-Strike is a very costly business, by the way. Apparently, teams are reportedly losing up to a million dollars a year on supporting Counter-Strike teams. And that number could be, you know, a lot bigger, a lot smaller. I haven't really dived too deep into that. But even then, yes, people are losing money on Counter-Strike teams because there's just so many different tournaments and formats and events and all sorts of craziness. So they're trying to create some kind of consistency here. And that's what the ESL Pro League is attempting to do along with b site which is another Pro League. And this is where the competition of these two come into play because b site is something that's being handled by Thorin and a few other notable personalities in the Counter-Strike space. Whereas ESL Pro League is, well, being ran by ESL and they have made some weird choices uh, as of late, such as announcing that these were, you know, there was a list of teams that were invited to participate in the ESO Pro League, but this was not the list of teams that were confirmed to participate in the ESO Pro League. Uh, that pretty much drew the ire of so many people in the Counter-Strike community because they were like, you announced that these people are invited 
but you made it seem like they're in the league. You know, I, I honestly, like, I get what ESL was trying to do. That was just posturing that they were uh, attempting to do there. And it just created this huge discussion around this. Valve doesn't want exclusivity. That's something that they have been very, very clear about. They don't want any of these uh, leagues like ESL to just own the entirety of the pie. But this has been something the ESL has been working on for such a long time, ever since the formation of WESA, which was a collective of teams that would be involved in the league. And then you had Face It responding with ECS along with Twitch. There was just so much, there's just so much drama, but there's always been this objective to just get control of Counter-Strike. And honestly, I don't really think that this is gonna be it for either side, but we'll see what happens. So the ESL Pro League uh, had an interesting summit take place where teams like Cloud9 and Astralis were there to participate uh, and, and have discussions around the future of CSGO. And some teams have already said that they're gonna sign up with the ESL Pro League and then we don't really know what's going on with B-Site. What we do know with B-Site right now is that we know the talent that is going to be associated with it, like Semler, Moses, James Bardoff, DDK, Anders, Freya, uh, Sean Gares, Thorin, and Monte Cristo. Uh, so clearly this is something that they, they were really adamant on getting out there. And B-Site is something that is being worked on along with Face It. Again, the two players in this space that have always been kind of going toe-to-toe -to -toe against each other has been Face It and ESL. Meanwhile, Blast is like off in the corner and they're like, hey, we're good because we got our events and everyone's going to watch them because they're exciting and they're fun to watch. Uh, so I'm curious to see what Blast does in 2020. But as of right now, they seem to be in a great position because, well, I mean, they're they're running tournaments and people want to watch tournaments. That's just kind of how it works. Basically, this is going to be a weird time for Counter-Strike. And we don't know all the information about B-Site yet. B-Site's kind of been under wraps. Uh, Thorin, though, has been very public on social media about his distaste for what ESL has been doing. Uh, ESL Pro League has since rescinded their image and issued out an apology, if you will, about the format and the way that it, it, it sounded. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing story. We'll continue keeping an eye on this. But it's interesting to see where Counter-Strike goes from here because there's certainly going to be a lot of drama one way or another. So another bit of news I'm sure you guys didn't expect me to talk about was the Brawlhalla World Tour. Yes, Brawlhalla. Uh, in case you guys aren't familiar with the game, it's essentially, it, it looks like Smash Brothers at first glance. Uh, it's not really Smash Brothers, but it has that flair, that, that style uh, of it. You have a variety of different characters that you can play that come with their own weapon. So unlike Smash, where weapons are not allowed or items are not allowed, here, the characters do use the items, the the, the brawlers. Um, it's it's really it's a really fun game. I love it. I play it on my Nintendo Switch all the time. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that this has ha been an ongoing esport for about five years now, which is uh, kind of wild. And this year, they're looking to expand even more and add just more events to the fray. And this is from the website here. It says, this is the fifth year of official Brawlhalla Esports and it's bigger than ever. With the Brawlhalla World Tour, you can look forward to bigger tournaments, increased prize pools and more. And what more really implies is just that there's gonna be more events, there's gonna be more to play for. And, and it's just it's just cool to see. It's cool to see that this thing you know continues on. I know that they uh, plan on doing some pretty big money events, lots of cash on the line for this game. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they could do. The events have already been announced for the most part. There's going to be the Winter Championship in February. Then they go to CEO Dreamland. They're going to have their Spring Championship in April, Combo Breaker in May. They're going to go to Low Tier City in July, but that is going to happen after their Summer Championship. They'll do an Autumn event as well. And then from there, their Grand Finals, the World Championship will take place in November. Just something to put on your radar that I think is pretty fun. And if you want to check that out, go to brawlhalla.com slash esports. Keeping in the tone of brawlers, let's talk about Super Smash Brothers uh, because Genesis 7 just concluded. And in Melee, you had Zayn topple Hungry Box to pick up a very emotional victory. Hungry Box, one of the best players, if not the best player in Smash. So Zayn getting that victory is huge for him. Hungry Box, a part of the gods of, of Melee. And Zayn with this up and coming crew is really creating a, a nice storyline of whether or not the gods can continue to maintain their position at the top of the Melee Mountain 
or are the new young gods coming into this and potentially knocking him off? And then on the Smash Ultimate side, MKLeo's 4 Pete was actually denied at Genesis 7 as Mars picked up a huge 3-0 win over Smash Ultimate's most dominant player as of late. Hasn't been much of the difference maker throughout the set thus far, but when MK Nail leaves him the most, can he make the impact? Finds I dare it. say, not, not enough. yet. Ooh, somehow managed to make it back to stage, and now lining up the back here, tries to get with the side. Oh, oh my God! It no, is. for Pete, just defeat. Mars is going to take Genesis Seven. The dawning of a new king is upon us. The four Pete denied. Mars standing at the top of the mountain in his PG colors and credits to Leo for the utmost respect, but it is that young man, Mars, who has ended one of the greatest tournament winning streaks we have ever seen in Super Smash Brothers. Congratulations, New England on the map. How about that? Man, I mean, New England it's safe to say that if you want to watch an exciting esport, check out Super Smash Brothers, whether it's Melee or Ultimate, whatever it is your cup of tea, you will not be disappointed. If you've never watched it before, I implore you to give it a watch. It is so awesome. They've had multiple major events back to back, and I cannot wait to see what comes next for Super Smash Brothers. The next major event for Super Smash Brothers will be Smash Summit, which is hosted by Beyond the Summit. That will be taking place February 13th to the 16th. There will be 18 players involved in that one. Some great names are already associated with it, like Axe, Hungrybox, Mango, Left and Pulp, uh, Wizrobe, Zane, Amsa, really just some, some nuts players. And this will be an event for Melee, by the way, not for Ultimate. But then the next major event for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate will actually be Frostbite. Uh, that will take place February 21st to February 23rd. This is registered as more of a premier event uh, with a prize pool of around $11,000. There will be some notable entrants in there as well. Names that you may have seen before, like MK Leo, Nairo, Maester, Raito, uh, so on and so forth. I believe Mars will also be there as well. So this could be a great opportunity to see whether or not Mars can keep this train going. Number of players registered for that event apparently is over a thousand. So Smash Brothers continuing to impress with the attendance numbers. And then the LCS launch. Yes, indeed. We are hot into the League of Legends Championship Series season. We had our first episode of Monday Night League. It was awesome. I also want to give a special shout out to my friend Latigris, one of the best up and coming talents in this space. She's now the host of Monday Night League and I couldn't be more excited for her future. But looking at the LCS and what we started off with, really cloud nine dignitas off the 2-0 starts and i couldn't be more excited for dignitas because i think a lot of people wrote this team off early on said they they weren't really going to make a dent in the space and then boom here we are 2-0 starts for them but the real story has been tsm struggling to make any kind of impact and going down 0-2 at the start of the lcs season losing to the newly returning immortals and then team liquid which isn't all that surprising given how good team liquid is but what is surprising is that tsm just have not found their footing yet. This one, Infernal Drake critically, 20 seconds still left before it spawns. It gives these teams some time to reset, but Double It is already on his way to the bottom river, to the Scuttle yeah. Crab, to get ready and set up shop. Yeah, that's the problem. TL are going to be the first ones there. So again, TSM is going to be having to face check into them with no flash on Biofrost. There's no one on TSM who can safely walk forward into these brushes. So it's all coming down to this. I think whoever wins this fight is gonna have a stranglehold on the game. This is Armageddon for these two teams, and Biofrost is not long for the world. He is gone. Impact barely gonna be kept alive there. Shurnfire also looking to walk away. Dardoch, just a sliver of HP remaining. Impact's got the CC. Team Liquid's got the fight. Broken Blade with a nice flash away, but Devilus goes on a killing spree. He'll get Bjergsen. Jensen grabs Dardoch, and with four dead on TSM, that has got to be the fight that wins TL this game. Yeah, that's gonna do it. They're not even gonna grab the soul. They're just running it down mid lane with the Baron buff, knock down this inhib, and look for the end. Broken Blade is either going to be the greatest 1v4 gangplank we've seen in years, or this is a team liquid win right here. Shurnfire on the front line, the rest of the team right behind him. Broken Blade and Biofrost, 
nothing they can do, and Team Liquid will get that win. League returns February 1st with some best of ones, CLG versus 100 Thieves, Cloud9 versus Immortals, Dignitas taking on Team Liquid, and Evil Geniuses going toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Golden Guardians. Then on February 2nd, Liquid will take on FlyQuest, 100 Thieves will then go up against Cloud9, EG versus TSM takes place, and then Immortals will go up against the Golden Guardians. Lots of great games following February 3rd, which will be the next installment of Monday Night League. We'll have Fly Quest versus Team Dignitas, and then a big boy, a big one, one that everyone's going to tune in for. It's TSM versus CLG, a rivalry as old as League of Legends itself. And then in Rainbow Six news, the Six Invitational is upon us. February 7th to February 9th, we'll have the offline group stages start. Then on February 11th to February 12th, we'll have the first two days of the playoffs take place. Then on February 14th, to Sunday, February 16th, we'll have the final two days of playoffs, and then, of course, the grand finals to crown our six invitational champion. And the pools are looking pretty good so far. In Group A, you have Team Empire, Dark Zero Esports, FaZe Clan, and Fnatic. Group B is Navi, Rogue, TSM, Space Station Gaming. And in Group C, it's Giants Gaming, NIP, Ninjas in Pajamas, Team Liquid, MIBR. And finally, Group D will be Team Reciprocity, Wildcard Gaming, BDS Esports, and the invited G2 Esports. Now, the G2 Esports inclusion in the Six Invitational has caused a, a, a healthy amount of discussion, I would say, because a lot of fans feel like G2 simply just don't deserve it. They have had their opportunities to qualify for majors. They have not. Some people felt like Force should have gotten the invite rather than G2. Uh, but I'm not really in that camp. I really do genuinely believe that G2 Esports, the winner of last year's Six Invitational, deserves a chance to defend their crown. Now, some may say, well, Golden Boy, you know, one, you, you didn't know the difference between Fabian and Pengu. Lol, I'm kidding. But two, that was, uh, that was a year ago. Rainbow Six has changed fundamentally since then, and I just don't agree with it. I think G2 is still a top team. I think that they have the opportunity to come out of Group D. Do I think that they're going to win? I, I don't think so, but I am pumped to see whether or not G2 can silence all of the doubters. This is going to be a big opportunity for them. It's going to be an awesome event. And also, I'm going to give a special shout out to our new stage host for Rainbow Six, Anna Prosser, a veteran in the space. In case you guys don't know about her, just, just look her up. Anna Prosser, one of the greatest to ever do it in all of esports. And the R6 community couldn't be more more elated to have her because she she is just such a, a class act so i think uh this event's gonna be awesome i can't wait to watch it again it all starts february 7th live from canada or, or canada sorry guys don't get mad at me finally we could talk about some professional call of duty no more speculation we got the numbers folks and it was awesome the cod league officially launched in minnesota at the armory it was great to watch and i covered a youtube streaming deal extensively but it's safe to say that call of duty will do just fine on youtube getting i think as high as 102,000 viewers for the Huntsman Optic game. And then the VODs for Call of Duty League have been doing incredibly well with pretty much every game going well over 200,000 views. It's safe to say people really want to watch competitive Call of Duty and YouTube is the place to be in order for you to do that. Now we started off the COD League with the Huntsman versus the Dallas Empire. For those who don't know, the Chicago Huntsman are the team that embodied the spirit of the old Optic Gaming, being that it is ran by Hex, Scump is in it. You also have Formal there too. So T2P, everyone's really excited about that. And then Dallas Empire, that is essentially Envy. It's a, a team that is ran by Hastro. You just see the, the makings of a great rivalry here. Or at least we thought we would because the Huntsman pretty much obliterated the Empire three to one. Well behind those kills, Chicago's gonna get some breathing room. Here comes the final push for Dallas. We'll see if they're able to get inside and at least extend this to another center hill. Our city's now 38 and 22. Two minutes in the hard point, but it's scum formal in I, I think it's to done. lighten it up. Eight more seconds needed. Can Empire get in? Can they get a touch or will it in here? Nobody's gonna get close enough. It's Chicago! 
come in and dominate the respawns, and they are letting them know across the stage. Now, I use Obliterate in a very aggressive manner, and I understand this, uh, but it just seemed like the Empire, for whatever reason, were not prepared for what the Huntsman brought. Now, in Search and Destroy, the Empire looked great. And if there's one thing that the Huntsmen are going to struggle with this season, it's Search and Destroy, from what I've seen so far. But the Empire just do not seem to have a grasp on what to do on Respawn quite yet. I think this team, though, is going to be the, the quickest turnaround of improvement for any team in the league. I could easily see the Dallas Empire walking away this season into the playoffs and maybe even contending for the title. That's how good I think this team is. But for right now, the day belonged to the Chicago Huntsmen. The New York Subliners and the London Royal Ravens should have been an easy clap for the Subliners. But instead, we end up getting the Royal Ravens toppling New York 3-0. Dylan is starting 2020 like he finished 2019 and he ain't stopping anytime soon with 35 seconds left on the clock. Ravens breaking that 200. At this point, they're just toying with them. They're playing with them and you heard that in that communication. I mean, it's not looking good for New York, but hey, it's the first map. It's the first you know match they've had in the entire COD League. Plenty of time to go back to the board and have a look at what went wrong here. But you've got to think about what's going right for London. The pace they're setting right now is just impossible. I mean, Ray, <laughs> he's delivering a very, very profound message typically it's pigeons that deliver them but today it's the ravens ravens are stood up ravens know it's over and when you just finish things so strong i guess this is the the reward of this you can rub it in a little bit but the royal ravens come out on top it's a thumbs up from scraps as a 3-0 sweep what a convincing victory what a mark on the cdl if you want to talk about utter domination, the London Royal Ravens just looked like on another level in comparison to the subliners. And I don't know what's going on with the team, but I'm hoping that they're going to be able to turn things around. When this roster was put together initially, I had my reservations. I felt like they were a good team, but they may not be a team that contends for a, a title. Now, after this week, I'm just concerned about whether or not this team is going to make it throughout the season because there's just a lot of uncertainty there at least for fans of new york that are wondering what happened in those games because not only did the subliners lose uh to the royal ravens but then they also lost to the atlanta phase and i think the atlanta phase one was something that we we kind of all saw coming because atlanta phase they are the best team in the league maybe you can say the huntsmen are but i genuinely believe right now it's atlanta phase uh and subliners just were not able to contend with them but then minnesota honestly were the biggest surprise of Minnesota's homestand. And the reason why I say that is because we started things off with the Los Angeles Gorillas going up against the Minnesota Rocker. And at first you thought that the Gorillas were simply just gonna run away with this, but that was not to be the case because some drama ensued. When the LA Gorillas went up 2-0 in the series, they ended up losing their game to win to the Rocker because Lacefield used an illegal perk. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not this has been a right call for the league, but it certainly was the right call for the Minnesota Rocker because they were able to come back and win three to one, pretty much taking all of the gas away from the Gorillas, giving them no chance to be able to come back into this. And they looked really impressive in the process and you may think to yourself well this probably was because the gorillas had lost momentum after losing or getting that game two removed from them and forfeiting it to the rocker but no the rocker continued on to look good against the toronto ultra the battle for the north and it would be the minnesota rocker that comes out on top three to one they're leaving week one two and zero oh, when dallas empire is leaving zero oh and two the map takes the series dominates the North with these final eight points. Scrambling in is Ultra. Can they get in? Can they slow it down? Can they get to a map five? They can't do it. It's a rocker victory. So there's just been so much discussion around whether or not this is the rocker just having a good weekend at the right time or if they are in fact a really good team and 
I actually have to side with the fact that they are a good team. This was a squad that a lot of people slept on going into the league, and they proved a lot of haters wrong. They don't have big names. They that, That's the other thing, right? They have got RX. He's probably him and Silly are the biggest names on that team. But when you think about professional Call of Duty, those are definitely not the two names that come up to the top of your mind. But God RX was one of the best players coming out of last season, right beside Simp as top rookies. And Simp is on the Atlanta Phase, who are 2 0 and are dominant right now. Why wouldn't the Minnesota Rocker be in the same position? Uh, I think this just goes to show that power rankings, while fun, oftentimes leave a lot to be desired because once you get down to the games, you never know who is going to show up and perform at that day and time. So now we move on to London, England for the Royal Ravens first hosting of the Call of Duty League, February 8th to the 9th. And man, that weekend is gonna be stacked with so many events. But for that event, we'll have notable matchups such as the New York Subliners taking on the Paris Legion. Let's see whether or not the Subliners can bounce back after that horrendous start 02 in Minnesota. Chicago Huntsman versus Aix and the Los Angeles Gorillas, which is going to be fun because it's Aix versus Optic again, and a boy, oh boy, I cannot wait. And this is also going to be the first event with the new tournament format. So we're not going to be using a regular season format like we saw before, or at least we saw for the Overwatch League. Instead, each weekend, we'll see a series of tournaments being played. And there was some discussion from Aix of the Los Angeles Gorillas about whether or not it's fair that the Chicago Huntsman and the Atlanta Fays will never go up against each other because people believe that there could be some kind of collusion from the league. But the more likely situation is that when they planned this whole thing out, they never really anticipated doing this tournament structure and instead doing a regular season structure, which I'm sure would have saw Atlanta Faze and Chicago Huntsman go up against one another. There were some adjustments being made, and because of that, we're now in the situation that we're in. I don't know, and I don't think that there is any collusion from the league, to be 100% honest with you all. But I also understand Aix's perspective because it does feel like you're keeping the two, at the time, best teams separated from one another just for the sake of storylines. But once again, we will have to wait and see. February 8th to the 9th, London, England, the Royal Ravens. It's going to be dope. You can check it out on YouTube at youtube.com slash Call of Duty League. And finally, Apex Legends had their first Global Series qualifier, and it was a little bumpy as EU has yet to conclude, but North America has been decided, and the top teams coming out of this are going to be TSM, Sniper Abusers, Rogue, Team Squidward, and RCO White making it to the major in Arlington, Texas. EU, like I said before, will be decided at a later date, but other regions have completed their qualifications as well. Now, the format is certainly interesting with the top five players earning flight and accommodations in Arlington, Texas for the $500,000 major for the Apex Legends Global Series. There's just been a lot of storylines coming out of that qualifier, such as TSM continuing to be a dominant force. Team Squidward, a no-name team, getting that huge opportunity to compete in Texas. But for me, it's all about the Sniper Abusers. That team is going to be Godolphin, BCJ, and Snipedown. Now, some of you guys who know me know Snipedown. Snipedown, professional Halo player who has won many events in the past, is now looking to take that same success and bring it over to Apex Legends. And so far, he's been pretty good at it. He's continued to have some huge showings, and while Poland didn't necessarily go in his favor, they still proved to many people that they are here to compete at the top level. TSM, though, continue their reign of dominance, and I honestly don't see anyone stopping them. They just know how to play the game. They know how to rotate. They know how to put themselves in advantageous positions time and time again. But will they be able to win the Arlington Major? Will EU finally have a team that takes a top crown at a major event for Apex Legends. It's going to be sick. I I'm really excited for it. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If Apex Legends can get some of their, you know, more buggier things under control, I could easily see this being one of the top esport titles of 2020, simply because it is an exciting game to play, and it's also an exciting game to watch. Things are getting intense here. Aberlele and Reps trying to hold on three seconds till the next circle as well. Rogue Drop finds one mini. And TSM Howl bleeds out, so dropped really finishing off Team Smile. Aberlele with a grapple goes in, but he's down. It looks like Rogue, Vayne, and Lion are still competing. It's two squads left. It's Rogue versus Vol. Who's going to take it? 
Let's see now if Bolt in a hard spot. They've already lost on. That's another player down. Now just Neven. Can he get this out? Rogue is going to collapse and fly in. Yes, indeed. Rogue wins your game number five and almost certainly secures themselves a top five finish. That is huge. In game five, securing top five. So we'll see who is going to be joining the likes of TSM, Sniper Abusers, Nor Rengu from Japan. The list goes on and on when EU finally decides their top five. The Apex Legends Global Series Major takes place in Arlington, Texas at the Esports Stadium March 13th to the 15th and $500,000 will be on the line. But keeping the trend of Apex Legends Esports going here, I had the pleasure of talking to a good friend of mine, someone who I've known for many years, and I've had the opportunity to cast many of his matches and some of his wins as well. It's Snipe Down, and we caught up about what it means to be a competitor that transitions from Halo to Apex Legends, and also whether or not he regrets not sticking with Call of Duty when he competed back in Call of Duty Ghost. It was a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's take a listen. All right, now I am joined by none other than Snipe Down from the Sniper Abusers, I guess, qualified for the uh, Apex Legends Global Series Major in Arlington, Texas. It's going to be pretty hype. Congratulations, man. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing fantastic. Happy to be here. Super excited about uh, having the stress off our shoulders from being able to attend Arlington. So, yeah, definitely feeling good. So why Sniper Abusers? Why was that the name of the team that you guys chose? Well, we didn't really have an organization to go under, so we decided, you know, the meta right now is to to use sniper rifles and scouts, and we are going to take advantage of that. So that just it became the first thought for a team name, and we went with it. Awesome. Love it. I know that there is a lot of dispute, conversation. Your tweet when you qualified was very, I, I'm not going to say it word for word, but it was essentially like, play what you want to play. You are known as a controller player. I've always been a firm supporter of it. Even though I haven't been playing more keyboard or mouse lately, there, there's something in the back of my mind. It's mostly because of you that keeps telling me, <laughs> just play controller. You want to play Call of Duty, play controller. You want to play Apex, play controller. You are kind of like, on at least for me on the Apex side, the leader of the controller gang on Apex. Why did you decide to just stay with that rather than switching over to keyboard and mouse? Like a lot of your other colleagues probably would have. So for me, I, I've been playing on a controller and a joystick. You know, I started with N64, and if I can do well with one joystick, then I, I feel really comfortable with two. And some C so, buttons, you know? <laughs> yeah, right? The, the C buttons that are giving me my looking up and down like GoldenEye. That mm -hmm. was real. For me, you know, I've been using controller for 20 plus years at this point in my life. If that's what I'm most comfortable with and the, the most, I guess, on point with how I'm making my decisions, because for me, a keyboard is so unfamiliar. You know, aiming is always the same thing for me. You know, you can, you, everyone can get good aim with good hand-eye coordination. Yeah. But using yeah. a keyboard as an unfamiliar device where I'm using all my fingers instead of just one thumb for directional and, and using numbers for hotkeys and things like that, it just really throws off my whole game sense. And since I'm so comfortable with controller, I just stick with it. I'm, I'm confident in my decision making and what what comes down to making a player great is what's in their head and the, the decisions they make there instead of you know the input device they use yeah for sure i totally get it uh, i think that especially when you're you've just been so comfortable with this for such a long time it's hard to to be like oh yeah you know i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna switch over to this other platform but still expect to be at the the top of the game it's kind of like gives you that little bit of a, of a nudge because you already were at the top of Halo, and now you are able to rightfully claim that you're one of the you know bodies sitting at the top of of Apex. You know, and I know it may not feel like that until you hoist a trophy over your head, and TSM has pretty much been stopping everyone from being able to do that. <laughs> uh, but you've managed to get close a few times. I think besides Poland, I think you crashed out or something like that. Uh, if I'm yeah, correct. I try to forget about that yeah. whole situation. You know, <laughs> but there's but there's no world where you. Like, like, had things gone the way that you, we all kind of expected, your decision making is is really just insane. It's it's crazy to see you do this not only in Halo but also do this in Apex. What did you feel like was w made sense in the transition? Like, how, what was the thing? Because it, it it is a different game, right? Like Apex to Halo, they are two completely different games. Respawn, known for Call of Duty and and this style of gameplay that they made that arcade shooter and then halo is more of that arena shooter style what did you just find it a natural transition or what, what was it that made sense to you to just start playing apex competitively i've actually thought about this question a lot because it it's really hard for me to start getting into a game and really invest into it you know I, I played fortnite at the start and that game just became a little outside of 
what I find enjoyable in a shooter. And Fair. when I started playing Apex Legends, I realized that the whole backing off uh, behind cover and, and, sh and shielding up in a game where you can't really just die that quickly. You know, you don't go down that fast. And I think that reminded me of the way that Halo gameplay works because you still usually have a, a some time to back off, reconsider how you had that approach and then make a different decision or, you know, attack head on again. And Apex has that. And you're able to, you know, back off, think about your decisions. And in a battle royale, you really have to be aware of, you know, you have one life. You can't make overextended plays without having full confidence that it's going to work and, and it's a percentage game. And I feel like that really relates to Halo to me. When I realized that in a pub format, that it, it gives me that nice game sense and, and enjoyability of being able to, you know, win one-on-one -on -one fights and seclude areas of the map and hold my opponents out. And I, I really haven't had that outside of Halo. So it felt really good. And I wanted to kind of roll with it and, you know, attempt another competitive title while Halo is yeah. kind of in more of a transition phase. Do you think that you'd go back into Halo? W what if Apex were to blow up? Would it be like, you know, Frosty situation where now he's playing for, uh, what is it, the Dallas Empire, I believe? Uh, no, uh, Shotzi and Hook are on the Shotzi Empire. Shotzi are on the Empire. Sorry, Shotzi Frosty's and Hook. Frosty's on, Frosty's on the Mutineers. Yeah, I knew I was getting that wrong when I was saying it in my mouth. Uh, so, <laughs> do you think that you'd stick with Apex or, or like, it's what, what's a very you, similar yeah. situation? Yeah, well, it, it's a similar situation. So, I, I think I'm going to be aware of like what I feel very comfortable going back to Halo and being, you know, near the top or, or making a really talented roster. Um, I think it, it is a question mark of seeing Apex's future. I think that's, you know, we have a year of events already lined up for us which is great to have a schedule planned out you know that's huge just to know that things are coming regardless you know when halo infinite news starts getting announced i think i'm gonna really see where i'm at in apex at the moment and make a kind of a judgment call off of that all right well let's see where you're at at the moment in apex because at the moment you have pretty much competed in every major competition at x games you have you, you i think we got third or second uh, I want to say it was third. Yeah, you got second. You got second at X Games. You got second here for the qualification at the major. Uh, I know that Poland, as we mentioned before, will just forget about that one. But uh, you, you have this experience. You've had this success that not a lot of people have been able to claim in Apex. And you've been very consistent with it. Even then, though, you've been playing with different teammates every time. And yet you, you still manage to remain consistent. What is it about your ability to build a team that has worked out for you so far because this is insane like this kind of consistency is not something you see all the time man i think that's something i i've been a free i feel like i've been a roamer my entire career for the most part like i've been on so many different rosters i think you know i like to think that i i bring out so like the best in, in people and i really feel like that comes from a, men, a strong mentality and just realizing what's important in these games and not letting stupid stuff frustrate your in-game vibe as a team because it is a unit and it's like a relationship in any sense whatsoever if you're having issues with a player someone's making stupid decisions they need to acknowledge it and you need to acknowledge it and, yeah. and bring it to light and if, if nothing changes then it doesn't sound like that's a, a relationship that can work so until you find a good strong core group of people that are willing to take constructive criticism and even if it gets ugly at times understand that everyone has a similar mindset and a similar goal of what we want to accomplish then you always have that ability to be on a top roster or stay at the top if you are there at one point you know and the, the number one thing it's like if, if someone if a teammate starts to think that you know you're challenging their opinions and you don't respect them it's like why would they be teammates in the first place you know i don't pick up two people on my team that i don't think i can win with going forward for them to question you know like if i think they're good or not at, at any point in time so i think you see teams like even tsm or sentinels and in these rosters that are actually very hard on each other and from an outside perspective people might think that you know they're toxic to each other etc but in the end they all want the same thing and i think that's why they're so great and consistent uh in general your roster right now is godolphin uh yourself bcj bcj coming from t1 godolphin was in a few different teams like uh, alistair just random squads how did you find out about this player from denmark and and why and why did you take the risk because i mean looking at looking at everything here i mean uh, you know if you take a Gander at Liquipedia, his his highest placing is going to be before this qualifier was second at Liquid Apex Proving Grounds Four, which was <laughs> nothing crazy, and then he got a third at Apex Pro Europe League, which was another weird competition that happened. 
um, that was like more kill hunt friendly, not what we're seeing right now. Why did you guys decide to go with Godolphin? BCJ, I think I, I, you know, I understand, but where did Godolphin come from? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll start kind of with just a little bit the quickest form of, of where BCJ came from. So he was on original T1 roster, almost actually picked him up for the the first X Games, but some circumstances happened. So mm-hmm. he's always been in my he- in the back of my head as a great player, and he just so happened to be a free agent. Godolphin actually. Um, some reason I keep getting European teammates, and I don't really understand how that's. It's not really it doesn't seem too normal, but I guess I just like. I got a European wife. Apparently, I like having a European teammate. <laughs> okay, Maybe a, little, okay. a little bit. Of, I don't know. You know, something's there. Apparently, but, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Hal actually, uh, someone I respect in terms of gameplay and just you know their view on the game, mm-hmm. actually tweeted out that he thinks Goodolphin was uh, one of the best free agents available on the market. And uh, certain circumstances just happened within my team. At the time, Refrex just got picked up by NRG or was in that process, and I needed to look for talented players. And it's really difficult because there was only so much time before the qualifiers. Yeah. And you really have to be, you know, specific with who you want to play with. And, and if it doesn't feel great right away, then something, you know, isn't right. I think it should feel good right away, regardless of even placings. If it feels good, then there's something there. I was teaming with Frex at the time, and it was him, me, Goodolphin, and Frex. Um, and scrims went well. It, like, we didn't blow everyone out or anything like that, but it just felt like the communication was there, and we all had the same vision of kind of how we wanted to play certain things. And, and up just running with him and kind of I, I kind of stuck with Godolphin as a you know kind of a duo looking for someone else to kind of fit the piece of the puzzle and that just happened to be Brendan after a couple of rotations of players and we played with Brendan felt really good right away had a couple rough days after that but we had a good talk about you know felt good right away let's get back to that go back to what we were doing at the start and it just uh, a couple of rough patches but like we said we all we all felt comfortable with each other and just so happy yeah. to work out well. I always make the this mis- this joke about the new car smell when like a team gets together, but for you guys to be able to kind of go through that hurdle before this major event, I think is is definitely a big up for you all. And it helps, right? Because now you're you're going into Arlington. People would be foolish not to put you guys in the, in the favorites of of teams to look out for. Do you feel that as it currently stands with North America and EU, where do you think the strength lies right now? Because TSM have just been dominating everyone. And even when we do go, uh, you know, to Europe, uh, TSM is still on top. Do you feel like North America right now has a step over Europe? Um, you know, maybe putting you on, on, on blast here. So, you know, feel free to dodge a question if you want. But how do you um, feel about that little continental rivalry? I mean, I think with everything, TSM is just the most consistent team regardless. I think Europe has different play styles. Mm. I think TSM adapts the best overall to both the play styles and that's why they seem to be consistent in both regions but i think there are a lot of teams that their play styles would not necessarily be as good um i definitely think there's a a a bit of understanding of both which is i think that's honestly why i end up with a european teammate is because they provide a different insight on how like games should be played because europe seems to be more passive and and setup wise and na takes a lot of fights early I feel like. So it's just a different thought process, but I don't necessarily think one is better than the other. We really have only had one real international open event, which was the Krakow event. I don't really think X Games would count for that. That's true. And, you know, I and think... even then, you were with Mimu and Zero. Yeah, and, I was with and, two Europeans. We got second, lost to TSM second. by two points. Yeah. And we had, like, three days of practice as a team. I, and I had never competed in Apex at that point. Although TSM has won, you know, like, I guess four, four straight, in a sense, if you count this as a, a official tournament. Yeah. There's not a enough there but i mean if if anything like you still can't not say they're the best team tsm obviously has that just something something about them that just they seem to work out even even in the toughest of situations and like you said they adapt they adapt very very well but it seems like you guys are able to do the same thing as well right you had a few big games uh i believe in the finals your highest i think was like 12 points i think that was the one you guys won round uh, we three. got 24 points that game i believe Total. yes I'm yeah, looking. so we got 12 for the win and then 12 kills, I think, we had that game. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at it right now. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> huge round three for you guys. And it sucks, too, because that was the one where I left. after I had to go catch oh, my man. flight after that, and I didn't get to see that game. So, I was really pissed about that when Bravo was, like, in the chat. He was like, I can't believe they, they pulled it off. It was just so <laughs> hype. Um, oh, we were so hyped, too. We were screaming. Godolph, Dolph was next to me. We started both just, like, fist bumping, jumping up and down a little bit. That's so we sick. Hyped. We were hyped. 
Yeah, yeah, you guys had interesting rounds. I mean, that was a, a big game, right? A 12-kill game. You also had that placement, the first-place placement. Your mm-hmm. your placements from there were always within the top 10. You always ensured that you guys were in the top 10, uh, getting at least o- over two kills a, a game. How do you feel that that point structure? Uh, who do you think it favors? Do you think it favors the aggro players, or do you think that it favors passive play, like going going for the going for uh, first place? I definitely think it favors the teams going for first place. If you're smart with rotations and you can see circle zones and where they're going to end early, you can almost guarantee yourself at least a couple kills when the game starts coming down to the point where you know six teams are running in at the edge of a circle all getting shot at by scouts and wingmen when you can play late game and almost guarantee because once you're set up with you know watson fences and all that you can't just dive in because there's teams above them there's teams like next to them there's a lot of teams that are just waiting for someone to make that mistake and you're just throwing your own game at that point uh, you really have to be careful with you know playing for kills or for placements because it's a double-edged sword and you gotta you gotta be aware of when you do have opportunities to go seek out some kills Plus placement points, you know, that third to second point difference, that two point difference is pretty big. If you can get three kills plus the second place guarantee, that's five points while the team, you know, that could win the game might only get an extra three points if you all end up dying there. Yeah. So like we've done that a couple of times, like when we were playing against T1 was in one of our groups and they were above us in a building. And the only way for us to get to them was to run into storm and try and fight them on the roof or something. And it was just there was no chance we were going to get any of those kills. We were going to die. So we just all three died to storm so they don't get any kill points. Mm-hmm. And it's just a, you know, it's a math game at that point. And you really got to be aware of the the people in your group where they're standing. It's not that difficult to put the, the to tally the points together when it has an after report of where everyone stands. So I, I think it, it does become a bit of a, a bit of a mental game in that sense as well. Do, do you feel that the because there's been also a lot of discussion regarding griefing and people being I hate that term so that. much, I, you know, so real so quick, overused. my take on on this is because you know when I cast a Fortnite and all that, everyone plays the same game. As you mentioned, it's a numbers game. You literally just said if the players, if you know that these guys above you have X amount of points, there's just no reason why you're going to take this fight because you're just going to give them points. Why are you going to yep. give them points? You might as well just 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 dump off and just move on to the next game because that at that point it's useless, it's pointless. It bothers me because I see a lot of people in Apex, in competitive Apex, in the community talking about like, oh, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't push someone just to push them. And it's like, dude, if you if they have more points than you, <laughs> you want to get above them, right? What's your take on this? What's your take on griefing? What's your take on that strategic play when it comes? I mean, I kind of know your perspective based on what you just said, but you know, I kind of want to expand upon that yeah. if you don't mind. People were landing in the same spots as other people, and they're like, "You're griefing our game. You're griefing our lobby." And I'm just thinking, what do you think during these qualifiers? Teams aren't going to land on you. It's going to happen, and you need to be ready for any type of play style. So I made sure that our team played in not only the NA closed lobbies. Uh, of top teams, but also the open lobbies with a lot of these teams that were going to be trying to qualify. And we needed to learn how to play against multiple play styles because a lot of these pe- a lot of these open teams aren't going to set up early and just lock down a building. They're going to get antsy. They're going to think they have to make a play that they don't have to make. And you're going to have to learn how to defend a- against those types of play styles just as much as the top teams. I think the term griefing is almost just being unprepared for situations because at any time a team could push you at any time you have to be ready i don't really agree with that term i think people just overuse it and don't necessarily like they, it's just a term now it's not necessarily like a, a specific meaning like yeah. if i land on someone that's in t- it's all of a sudden i'm griefing or if i push a team that died their first thing is oh they're griefing us it's like okay well yeah. what if on their screens they saw that you guys were wide open from a flank and you just died to it you know in in, in that sense like you look like the, the bad team and you're just making an excuse. It's similar to W King. Yeah. It's it like is. when I everyone mean, yeah. just kept saying, you're just W King. You're just W King. It's like, no, I'm yeah. pushing you because I don't want you to get any more points. It's very, very simple. It's, it's like as valid as when a team kills you and then you just go, oh, that team's trash. I can't believe blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, they just killed you. So, so And they're going to keep like, playing. So is that clearly. just their trash out of frustration or do you actually believe that? Because then yeah. that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but that's just, you know, but I also is always funny because that's just general trash talk too, right? You it is. Up, so that's like, that's like kind of what the terms come yeah. down to it, it, anymore, I feel like. Yeah, it's lost its uh, its actual meaning, if you exactly. will. Exactly. Right? It, just, it just gets said now. It's just yeah. a commonplace. <laughs> that's pretty funny. So shifting gears uh, from Apex for a moment because, 
you know, you had a lot of success here and, you know, you're going to be going to the major, really looking forward to that. But I also want to reflect on your your history as well. Not necessarily the history you might be thinking about. You were actually a pretty darn good Call of Duty player. <laughs> and you made the shift uh, when everyone else was doing the same thing right after, I want to say, H4. Before H5, I believe, what was the COD you were playing? Was it Advanced Warfare? Ghost. It was Ghost. You were playing I Ghost. I wish I played Advanced Warfare. That looks so much more enjoyable. Yeah, so you were playing Ghost. And I'm so sorry. You were playing Call of Duty Ghost. Where I'm, I'm really games. upset that was the first... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it, it wasn't even that. It, what was the game stuff where you had to run into a goal? Oh, oh my lord. Oh, God. Blitz? Blitz. Oh, yeah, that, oh, that was the worst competitive game I think a game would have ever played. I know, because there was like no... <laughs> You're like a football running into an end zone. And there was also no penalty, too, because like you, you just, okay, I'm just going to run into this thing. All right, sweet, cool. And then you just go right yeah. back over to your spawn. It was like, awful. Yeah, so, but you were good. You you played for excellence. Yeah. You had a, a pretty decent run. Uh, I remember casting over a few of your games, and, and you, were, you were solid. One, why did you choose to stop Call of Duty? And I know Halo 5 came out, so there was obviously all that. Knowing what you know now, would you have stuck stuck with COD? I, I probably would have stuck with COD because I can't necessarily say I enjoyed Halo that much more, in a sense. I did enjoy Halo 5 competitively. I just felt like the game could have been better. Yeah, I, I personally just didn't enjoy Call of Duty Ghost. So I, although I knew I was good, I didn't have that same drive that I do for Apex or Halo at the time. For me, like you really need to enjoy the game that you're competing in for you to want to put in all that time and that energy and that effort. And I didn't have that. And I wish I would have given another Call of Duty a chance. I really do. Because there were a couple I really liked, but Halo was happening at the same time. Uh, it didn't end up working out. But I regret it a little bit because, I mean, obviously I see where COD's at now. I, I definitely think I had what it took to be a top player in that game, mm -hmm. uh, especially with them expanding, you know, to five players per team. There's like 100 pro, pro players, you know. I'm definitely going to, you know, have the confidence to think I could be at least one of the top 100 players in Call of Duty. I think back on it sometimes, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I truly believe, you know, if I didn't enjoy it, there was also that chance that I, I wouldn't have enjoyed it in the future, and I'm, I'm happy yeah. where I'm at for sure. Would you consider giving it another go? Probably like, not at this point, no. Yeah. I, I considered it for this last Call of Duty, but even then, I was like, I, I enjoyed Apex right away. I'm not going to not try it. And now it's, you know, it's to the point where it's all franchised. It's a little too late for that to get in. Uh, I, I feel like Call of Duty with it being a yearly game, you really have to jump out to a hot start as soon as the game comes out. There's yeah. really no other way to get your name in the scene unless yeah. it's right away. Yeah, I, I just find it funny. And that was why I wanted to ask that question, because I know like, you're like, oh, history. Okay, here we go. You want to talk about straight ripping? Oh, you want to talk about Halo? <laughs> Halo 3? I thought about it almost like as a, like an ego thing. I was like, you know, I got next game's battle at, on Apex. I got next game's battle at, on Halo. Maybe I can win something in Call of Duty and have a trifecta here. Yeah, I yeah. feel pretty freaking good, let me tell you, though. Hey, dude, I think it's sick. Like, you know, you, you managed to do something that not a lot of people can do. You still continue to be successful through and through. Uh, finally, you know, reflecting on, because you said you, you feel like a nomad, you're always like going across different teammates, different teams and, and things like that. How do you feel like the difference is if you had to describe how it is finding and working with a team in Halo versus finding working with a team in COD and then the same thing for Apex, what would you how would you define those three very distinct communities and those experiences that you've had having to transition between the three of them? It was so difficult to know who is good in Apex because it's a battle royale and that's just a completely different genre than I'm used to in any sense going yeah. from, you know, arena shooters. Um in Halo, you know, you you learn quickly who's who's good and who's not. You really do and people stand out right away on teams. Battle Royales are not consistent enough. We haven't had custom games. We haven't had leaderboards. We haven't had so many different methods to really determine what players are good that you have to make very instinctual calls on who you want to surround yourself with in a team. I think a lot of a lot of people just don't listen to the. They I don't I don't know. How, I can't really speak for other people. I just speak on for myself and on trusting my instincts on what feels right in game and kind of as a unit. We will work together in the future. So yeah, how how are the callouts and stuff like that? Yeah, the this just even just how we argue and if we at least come to the same like opinion of how we should have played something instead of it being like, well, I think we should have done this. Well, I think we should have done this. And then just like kind of like leave it alone. It's like you know, if we at least agree regardless of how we argue, then that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Did you notice it was like that in COD? Did you feel like players were a little bit immature in COD given the age or? Uh uh, maybe a little I, more I maturity felt in Apex. like COD was more of a community and they highly value their friendships and prioritize those and will vouch for their friends like every time. And so I think a lot of people in Call of Duty that were 
good also had that like you know it's almost like pro points back in the mlg days where if you had pro points you would get picked up over people who didn't have pro points specifically because you know you, you could get a better seed or whatever it is and i think that's how it was because it was under this it was like a similar situation so it it, it kind of felt like it kind of felt like that whereas apex you know like people are swapping around teams all the time and it's really just figuring out what what works as a three-man unit instead of you know a full team because that even that you know more, the more opinions the more conflict you can have at the same time wow uh and then you know lastly you guys are orgless right now no organization have you been talking to anyone or are you guys fine running solo into arlington <laughs> since you got that flight covered baby what are you gonna do I think that's definitely a very nice incentive is to be, you know, these tournaments are based around ALGS points and we're guaranteed those now because we're sent because we got top five, not only to the tournament with travel covered, but also with points that then seat us for future tournaments. And yeah. I think that alone is really helpful. I don't know what a lot of these organizations are doing right now. Um, you know, the tournament just ended. We're going to kind of you know, play it by ear. I think a lot of organizations are really figuring out what the best play is with Apex going forward because a lot of these orgs didn't make it to the top 20 in these in these regions so i think that's kind of you know a little intimidating at the same time it's weird how i see it from those kind of perspectives after being in this scene for so long but uh you know we're gonna play by ear i think we're really comfortable with where we're at you know if we if we go in without an org that's you know that is what it is but i think we're also very open to listening and, and seeing who uh would be the best fit for us uh, you bring up a really good point right because you talk about the organizations that didn't make it and even taking a gander right as semifinals one and semifinals two you in this alone, you had NRG and Team Liquid Blue that didn't make it past their semifinal, and then you had a uh, uh, Rise Nation, RCO Blue, Team Liquid White. So Team Liquid, no representation at all. Yeah, uh, I know Complexity didn't G two from the European region. I think a couple other European teams didn't make it. Uh, it it was it was a it was a gauntlet for sure. Yeah, Sentinels you almost know, right, like almost didn't make it. that. What they got 30, 39 points. Right they were in a the six way tie or something like that in the semifinals to make it to the finals so insane right how yeah. how that whole thing works so uh but you know are you are you guys talking to anyone right now has anyone approached you we, we've or? definitely had a couple approach us and, and we've had negotiations i think uh what was the best was before you know a lot of a lot of orgs didn't want to go in on something until they saw the results which is totally fair and i, I think now that you know the results are there it, it's they speak for themselves and i think a lot of internal discussion is happening and uh well, i'm sure We'll be hearing from a couple more soon, <laughs> dude. That's awesome. I hope man. so. Yeah, no, I no doubt. I mean, you have the pedigree, you have the experience, and and, and you just interview so damn well. So you know, <laughs> Thank you. I've always told you that, but I'd hope so at this point. In my uh, uh, if I'm still around, I'd hope I'd be able to. I think I've interviewed questions. you like at, at least a hundred <laughs> times. You know, I feel like <laughs> I'm just talking to you at this point. So I know, I know, I've known you for years, so it's pretty yeah. natural. That's why I thought this was like a cool conversation to have. Uh, hey, man, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. any shout outs you want to give before we uh, send this bad boy home. Yeah, I guess just shout outs to everyone who's been you know supportive. Uh, Apex, uh, my wife, all the people, Godolphin for coming out here and PC J, whole team, uh, rec for you know allowing me to get to this point as well, and I think uh, just excited for the future, definitely. So keep keep a lookout for us. And you check out the stream, right? Twitch. Yeah, check TV. out the stream. Twitch.tv slash snipe down. See, I got you covered, buddy. Don't worry about. Yeah. It. Never say I never did anything for you. <laughs> All right. No, I won't. Thank you so much, Snipe. I appreciate yep. your time, man. Best of luck with the major. All right, that's gonna do it. And again, a huge shout out to Snipe Down once again for taking the time to talk to me about his journey in Apex and really his journey as a pro player in general. It really has been something incredible to watch from the sidelines. Uh, but that is gonna do it for the third episode of that esports podcast. If you happen to enjoy it, make sure you go ahead and follow me on Spotify. You can also rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, feel free to subscribe ring the bell and you will be notified whenever I upload not only a new video but also a new episode of that esports podcast so much happened this week in esports and so much more is about to take place and that's why we love this big and beautiful world but we'll catch you on the flippity flip take it easy peace